Hello, everybody. I'm calling in from Chicago, Illinois. Today, you're here for setting your team up for success so anybody can write tests. Um, let me tell you a little bit about me. So my name is Zach. All right, these are my links, actually. So I've got my GitHub and Twitter is up there, my LinkedIn. Uh, you should be posted in the slides that I'll share after the presentation if you want to um, follow what I do. Um, so I'm the lead software development engineer in test at Review Trackers in Chicago. Um, I'm also the organizer of the Selenium meetup group here in Chicago. Uh, I speak at some of these kinds of things. I love to cook and I'm trying to learn piano. Uh, that's kind of one of my quarantine uh, goals. Uh, I'll also say I've been to, traveled to India before. Uh, I was at the last India Selenium conference in 2018 uh, and would love to be back over there in 2022, God willing. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Um, so here's today's agenda. The presentation will be divided into two areas. Uh, to set yourselves up for success, First, I'll talk about failing transparently, what, what it means to, to fail in a way that people know what's going on. People understand enough about the system under test to, to, uh, to act on it. And the tests uh, are transparent in how they're failing. So that's the first section. The second section, we'll, I'll be talking about creating a culture of testing at your organization so that anybody can write tests, contribute to tests, triage tests, etc. And I'll also say, yes, please uh, type your questions in the Q&A section. I will be monitoring that. And um, as my presentation is divided into two parts, I will stop in the middle and uh, answer questions about each of those parts. So please ask those questions. Um, so before I talk about failing transparently, I'm going to tell a little horror story. I hope you can all relate. Uh, so in this scenario, it's late on a Friday. Uh, our developer is actually developing a, uh, a new feature for the land authority. And it's not the space authority. They're developing a feature for the land authority. They run their continuous deployment tests, the ones right before going to production, and they see this error they are not touching the space authority. So they're a little bit confused why their land authority changes is, is causing the space authority error. They also don't really know what's going on. They're a little bit confused about the error. Uh, they've actually seen it before and didn't understand it then and they don't understand it now. So they ask the group, uh, hey, is it good to move forward? Can I, can I deploy the land authority? Uh, the rest of the organization gives the thumbs up. They've, they've seen it before. They don't really know what's going on. Uh, the test engineers are on vacation. Um, the rest of the QA staff um, wasn't, wasn't asked about it. So they move forward with the land authority change despite the failed test. They get all the thumbs up, as, as SpongeBob alludes to. And then, oh, no, it turns out that the land authority was deeply important for the space authority that failed test was a real true failure and the plan blew up so we've all been there right you know <laughs> it uh it happens uh so i think what what really happens there is like a failure of the tests uh the tests failed to communicate like the importance of of what what was failing they were hard to understand uh in terms of what was failing and um because they weren't easy to interpret, people were, felt complacent. They felt okay to move on. And there's that kind of institutional buy-in. They got the thumbs up from the other developers saying, oh, it's cool to ignore the test, but it turns out that the test was, was showing something important. So this talk will be about avoiding this uh, doomsday scenario. Hopefully your software testing scenarios aren't as dramatic, <laughs> but okay. so. Here are the kind of the five uh, sections um, that I'll talk about with regards to failing transparently. 
So the first way to fail transparently and clearly is to be a master of failure messages. What do I mean by that? Um, so um, each of you at your organizations, you have a suite of tests and you're probably using uh, assertion library. And I, what I would suggest is, um, I would suggest that you become an expert in what your assertion library makes failures look like. This this uh, image is a, a picture of what a Python um, PyTest error looks like, or assertion error looks like. So it's pretty good here. It shows you exactly where the assertion fails. And um, it kind of shows you how for um, is meant to equal five and it doesn't. Uh, so I think this one's decent. Um, I've got a couple others. Let's see. This is a J unit failure. Um, it has a little bit uh, of English. Expected six, but was negative six. Not bad. Not bad. Um, what I would, and then yeah, let's draw one more. Okay, so this is a Ruby failure. I I program in Ruby, so. I'm very used to looking at these RSpec uh, assertion failures. They kind of show what you expect and what you got, and there's some nice white space in between, and it shows you the comparison operator, which I always like. Uh, so again, I would posit to become an expert in what your assertion libraries, what their failures look like. You know, explore all of them. Explore every kind of failure that your assertion library can make and become an expert at reading those to, to know what, what, what went wrong. Um, here's some other examples of uh, like the frameworks making errors look different. So these are screenshots from um, the uh, Site Prism framework, which is a framework that we use uh, our view trackers with, with Ruby. And um, the error expected has text returns true, got false. Um, that comes from the uh, specific assertion library. It does not come from the testing library. So, um, yeah, you know, tests can be complicated. You know, you have a framework, you have Selenium, you have an assertion library, you have uh, a, a framework to interact with Selenium, and like all these different things can raise different uh, assertion failures. So, yeah. Be familiar with not only your testing frameworks assertion errors, be familiar with the custom ones that like whatever um, Selenium framework you're using can, can put forth. Um, this is another one from uh, a, a Java uh, testing package. I can't remember the name of it at the moment, but uh, it looks like this. Gives you the little a snippet of the HTML, so that's pretty cool. Um, so um, I've talked a little bit about the assertion library errors and becoming an expert in those, but uh, an additional thing to, to be aware of is knowing the difference between code errors and assertion errors. Uh, so for example, in this uh, screenshot, um, this is a no method error. So that's different from an assertion error. Uh, I think that if you have a code error, it's more likely that it's a problem with the um, test itself and not the software under test, but that's not always true. Um, so, but it's, it's good to know, like at a glance, if you see something like this, um, it's, it's different than, it's a different flavor of error than the, the assertion type of error. Um, here's another example of a code error. Um, it's a little bit complicated here, but, um, Basically, we were looking for one user row um, with that find uh, chunk of code and then um, a link within the user row. And what happened is the user row find block um, didn't return any user rows. So then I got this error. So in this case, it's kind of like, yes, I'm getting a code error, but I'm getting a code error because uh, it wasn't able to find any user rows. Um, so it's kind of related to Selenium, related to the front end, um, but you kind of got to read between the lines of, of the code error to, to see what's going on. Um, so something I'd also suggest uh, 
on your journey to becoming to failing transparently is if any of those kinds of failure messages don't cut it, make your own. Uh, a lot of uh, testing libraries provide ways to uh, allow for custom failure messages. On the on the left here is Python's uh, way of doing that. Um, it's like the second argument. And uh, on the right, RSpec. Um, expect array to be empty. And then um, after be empty, you can provide a custom failure message. Um, that's really great. I would suggest to use that. Uh, oh, one second. Get the message. OK. Um, yeah, so I would suggest uh, use your custom failure messages. And um, if if those um, custom failure messages, uh, the thing about them is they should really add to the to the existing failure messages. So I would say these two aren't even great examples, but a great example of custom failure messages is this one. This is one that I created at Review Trackers. Um, so this test um, is expecting um, a, a user to be indexed. And if the user is not indexed, it returns this kind of error. And this error is really great because it tells me how long uh, the test waited for the user to be indexed, it tells me what resource it was, it gives me the ID of the user it expects to be indexed, and then I can go and, and take that ID and explore my software under test and see what happens. I can, you know, I have some data to like investigate the, the situation. And it also shows the raw response from the indexing service. Uh, so I would suggest when you know when you make these failure messages, provide as much information as you can, make them actionable so that you can go dig under the hood of your software under test and uh, find out what went wrong. So that is this section. Let's go to the next one. All right. So. Another thing I would posit that you need to do to fail transparently is use status checks for the services your test depends on. So what do I mean by that? So to describe status checks, I'm gonna talk about this little sample app. So let's pretend we have a shopping cart here where uh, it gives you your item subtotal and the tax and the grand total. This is your shopping cart front end application. So under the hood um, in this situation, let's say the shopping cart your front end hits the shopping cart API, which hits the tax API to get all of the data that it needs. And then the shopping cart API assembles all the data it needs from the tax API and various databases and then sends it to the front end. So there's kind of two different service dependencies to get the data that you need. Um, so cool. So our tests uh, normally pass for this uh, shopping cart. However, um, let's say one day you, you get into work and uh, you see this failure, um, expectation not met error, and instead of $97, the test is getting $95.45. Uh, that's um, not great. You'd be like, what's going on? And you'd be like, is, is the error with the shopping cart API, is the error with the tax API, what's actually going on under the hood? And it's not clear, you, you'd have to dig into that because because of your um, infrastructure, you know that there are kind of two dependencies to get this data in, in the right state. So um, the fail itself isn't immediately actionable. But if you had status checks, you could create um, status checks for the endpoints your test depends on and then run those in the before hook of each test. Um, status checks are, are great. Um, you know, there's there's even entire companies built around this idea of uptime monitoring and status checks. I don't know if any of you have heard of the company Pingdom, but uh, one of Pingdom's main services is just, just pings your website and just make sure that it's up. It'll ping it like every five minutes. So what I'd posit is, let's say if you know your test depends on shopping cart API and tax API, um, set up a status check right before your test runs to ensure that shopping cart is up and tax API is up. So if either of them is not up, you won't even bother with running the test because it wouldn't make sense to even run the test if the service is down. Um, and then in this scenario, ideally, instead of getting that cryptic error where uh, you get 95.45, you'd get an error that says tax API is down. 
So then you can go investigate that instead of um, your cryptic test failure. So third thing I'll mention with failing transparently is configuring nice test reports. Uh, without nice test reports, there's lots of scrolling, there's no syntax highlighting, there's a lot of clicks to see an associated screenshot, and all of that leads to slower triage. Uh, that gives me a big headache. <laughs> uh, I don't like scrolling. I, I really enjoy syntax highlighting. I'm, I'm getting a headache reading that error on, on the left here. And um, it takes a more cognitive load to, to associate this failure with this screenshot in another browser tab, something like that. Um, I'll have to do some mental work to, to associate those two things together, especially if there are multiple fails. Now I'll be juggling tabs. Uh, I'll have one tab that has the test failure and then a couple other tabs with the screenshots open. So, so that's, that's kind of hard to balance in my brain. And it's already a stressful situation. So I would posit that to fail transparently, you need to have nice test reports. They're worth spending time, your time configuring. Um, why are they worth spending your time on? They create a calm atmosphere for those investigating. Those that are investigating can can look, uh, you know, at at once and see the screenshot. They can see the area of the test code where the test failed. They can see the assertion failure. It'll all have nice syntax highlighting. It'll have all the information that they need to triage it at a glance. And it's like I said, it's already a stressful scenario. When you're when you're triaging test fails, so I would recommend to get these uh, test reports configured. Um, if your boss is telling you that uh, it's not worth the time to configure nice test reports because they're like, oh well, you got to write all these tests first, and then we'll do we'll, you know we'll do this in Q4, we'll do this uh, next year. Uh, I'll say no, do it now because um, you'll save yourself time triaging tests like they're they're worth um so much more than the, the time spent configuring them and uh you can always tell your boss to talk to me and i will convince them to to use these nice test reports uh at review trackers we use the rspec html reporter gem and it's really great and it, it does the work of associating that that screenshot with the um the syntax uh, and the assertion error and, and everything in the stack trace, it's all, all in one report, it's really great. Um, so in addition to those test reports, we, we have some of the review trackers um, that enables us to uh, analyze test health across test runs. And we use a software called Report Portal and it's completely open source. I highly recommend it. Uh, I really, really love Report Portal. Um, the screenshot right here is, um, this is a list of tests that failed in the last 30 runs. And um, I can see our, our failure rate is kind of at a consistent 6.67%, not, not ideal. We're still, you know, tests are failing two out of 30 times, not great. But, um, you know, if I ever see a test, you know, fail five out of 30 times or 10 out of 30 times, then I'll be like, all right, something's going on here. And then that'll be my day. We'll be investigating uh, why that test is being more flaky. Uh, so, yeah, I would encourage you to configure something like this so you can get that, that analysis across test runs. It's very valuable to have. So, in addition to those three things, next topic is using a test logger. I would suggest that it's really important to log what your test is doing as it's doing it so that you can, again, fail transparently. So, what do I mean by a test logger? Um, you know how um, your software under test has logs and uh, the developers are always combing through those logs to determine, uh, you know, why there was a server outage on Friday or why, um, why uh, the data isn't present and stuff like that. People are always combing through logs. Well, what I would suggest is that the tests themselves also create logs that um, log important steps in a test case. Uh, so that can help you triage uh, the test fail when it happens because you'll know like what the test achieved, what, what it did, and what it didn't do and stuff like that. So um, some examples here of things that your test log can log are it actually successfully logging into the front end. So I have that message right there. 
highlighted. And then another example of something you might want to log is verifying that data is present that a test needs. So why might you want to do that? Um, I review trackers for our end-to-end -end tests. Sometimes we use uh, an API to do setup for the test. And we'll do that API call in the very beginning of the test. And then um, that's just setup. And the, the data that's fetched is uh, happens in an asynchronous way. So um, in order to be transparent about what's going on in the test, then we, we, we log a message when that API call is done and the data is, is done uh, fetching in the async way. So if that log message doesn't happen, um, we know that the data wasn't there. And we also assert on that data being there as well. But this is helpful as well because you can see how long it took to get that data. If, if um, one day we see the test that normally takes 30 seconds is taking uh, three minutes, we can look into those log messages and see, hey, how long did it actually take to, to fetch the data in the beginning? How long did it take to do that setup? And if we see those seconds go up in time from the log messages, we'll know that something's up with, the, with that API and that indirect dependency. So that's one of the reasons I really like using these, these test loggers. Um, some other reasons to use test loggers is when you're investigating a fail that only happens when it's run in parallel or when run in CI and stuff like that. In those situations, test logs are super helpful. Um, so I'll, I can describe a scenario um, where, where I, we use test loggers at review trackers. So as you can see in this GIF, um, this is our um, competitor's tool. And here, uh, the end user is changing the filter from 12 months to last two years. And we experienced an issue where um, it's not really shown in the GIF, but we experienced an issue where uh, you'd switch from 12 months to two years and the data actually wouldn't change. And we were kind of a little bit baffled. Like sometimes the data was changing, sometimes the data wasn't changing. Uh, we were trying to investigate why the data would change or wouldn't change. And one of the things we did was implement some test logging. So all that we did was we just logged what the test saw as it went. And uh, what that does is it just like provides a bigger picture of, of the data that the test is seeing. So um, here's some examples of the test was grabbing uh, all the data from the table before the filter, like before the change was applied. So it was here, it grabs all the data for the 12 months, and then uh, it grabs the data for the two years. And then by grabbing all the data, we can see what the test had saw. And then when, if the assertion were to fail, we can uh, dig into that more and see what data actually changed or didn't change. Um, so that's a really uh, cool way to do triage. Um, so test logs also mean that they're timestamps and you can correlate those timestamps with a message from the actual software under test logs. That's usually valuable. Um, if uh, here, here I'm highlighting a, a timestamp of a, a scorecard that's a functionality of review trackers generating in 18.7 seconds. If I ever wanted to see how, that scorecard generating in the software's under test logs, I can like look at that timestamp and then compare. And yeah, another it's another great way to to see what's going on uh, when a test fails. Look at the the timestamps from the log messages and correlate those with your software under test. Um, so one last thing that we do with our test logger review trackers is uh, we log the credentials of the test account used for each test. That is incredibly helpful because then you can log in and see the state of the system when the test failed. Uh, I do this on a regular basis. It's pretty much the first thing I ever do if I see a test failure is I will look at the um, logs and I will look at the um, admin username and the password and the account ID and then investigate the state of the system when it failed. I'll, I'll log in and I'll, be, I'll explore um, what was going on. So in the case that I described earlier, this case when we were seeing that the filter change wasn't reflecting, I went and logged into that account and um, filtered for myself. And I saw it, yeah, and I saw, yeah, uh, the data isn't changing when I changed from 12 months to two years. And I actually was able to, to see it uh, at a, um, with my own eyes. So that's always really great to do. Um, 
So the last way that I want to posit to fail transparently is to save test artifacts. What do I mean by test artifacts? Um, if your test grabs emails, saves PDFs, CSVs, any kind of, if your test grabs any kind of data, I would posit save them somewhere, save them to like a file server, save them somewhere where those files are accessible after the test run is finished. Uh, say where, save them somewhere that persists. And the reason why you would want to do that is that because that data can help you investigate fails. Um, and not only that, sometimes it's just helpful to see the data that the, the test uses. So here's a screenshot from our, um, our Slack um, test runner. And although this has passed, we even put a link to the test artifacts. And if you were to click that link, um, that would take you to a place like this where you have just a collection of all the CSVs, PDFs, everything that the test had downloaded and made assertions on in, its, uh, in the test life. So here's like the entire body of the email that it, that it checked. Um, so yeah, so this is great. If, if that email assertion were to fail, you can actually look at the email and see what the test saw. If the PDF assertion were to fail, you can open the PDF and see what the test saw. Uh, so I think test artifacts are really great. Um, save as many of them as you can. Mm, data never hurt anybody. Um, it, storage is cheap these days. Um, to get an Amazon uh, file server is really cheap or an EC2 instance that just stores files is really cheap. Um, so I would suggest you to store any kind of data that you can because you'll never know when you'll need it. You'll never know when you need it to investigate. Um, those kinds of fails. So that is the first half of my presentation. Let me see if there are any questions in the Q&A. Okay, it doesn't look like there's anything in the Q&A. Um, okay, since there's no questions, I'll move on to the second part of the presentation. Oh, all right. Sorry, can you say that one more time? Last 15 minutes. Okay, thanks, Hark. All right, so um, creating that, that culture of success and culture of testing. Here's how you do it. Well, before I tell you how, here's how you do it, I'm gonna describe a story. So it's early on a Monday and I'm a developer and this is our feedback form and it has five, it has uh, one to five stars and management has said, make it have one to 10 stars. We wanna have the ability to, to log feedback from one to 10. And you're like, all right, management, I'll do it. Sounds easy. So you spend your time early on a Monday doing the development for that feature and it's really easy. You just change a couple things, yada, 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 you're done you did all your code changes, but now you're like, hmm, I gotta update the tests, don't I? So you go in to look at the tests and the tests are more confusing than the code that describes the behavior. Um, this is a screenshot from an actual um, test I reviewed trackers before I started. And so there's a complicated SQL going on and you're like, wait, where do I edit this to make it be 10 stars and check that there's 10 stars? This is the area, isn't it? Um, here it's doing something with five stars. How would I change it to do things for 10 stars? Um, I'm really confused. I've lost all motivation to contribute to the tests. I have to wait till the test engineer is online. And that uh, made me angry. You know, I had a really great start to my day making the change in the code, but it should never be hard to, to make a change in the test associated with the code. That's just an annoyance. So. We wanna avoid this scenario. We want to create a culture of testing. We wanna make it easy for developers to, to write those tests. So how are we gonna do it? First way to do it is easy factories. So why easy factories? Um, you want your engineers to do their setup in a uniform way, have an easy time doing it. Um, and they should, factories, I will posit the factory should have default arguments and be easily configurable so that anybody can jump in and uh, create the data that they need uh, in like a second to do the test. They shouldn't have to know like the vagaries or the, the details of the, of the system to, to, to create that data. 
to, to become testable. So um, we have a factory review trackers called accounts with various users. And this one method call creates a new account, seven users, 30 reviews, all this data. Um, it's just one method and it creates all the stuff you might need for a test. Um, and it also accepts keyword arguments so that, you know, if you want it to only create three users, you can pass in users uh, three and then it'll only create three. If you don't want it to create reviews, you can say reviews false and it won't create reviews. So it's um, infinitely configurable. Um, and each resource itself has its own factory. It tags is its own, templates is its own, groups is its own, yada, yada, yada. So um, here's some pros of doing it that way. Um, then it's easy to configure the data to test. Um, uh, one method automatically configures all the associated records. And um, in terms of maintenance, uh, you can change the definitions for your database uh, for the factory all in one place to that accords to the database definitions. You don't have to go into multiple. So like if you change what a review looks like, you add a new column to the reviews um, table, you don't have to change your test code everywhere. You just change it in one place. But the cons of doing these factories is it does create extra data. You might not need all these associated records for your test, um, but uh, we're okay with that review trackers because of the time saving that that method of call uh, makes. And yet, factory still depends on database definitions. So like if you if you change your reviews table, you still need to update your factory to reflect the, the change in the reviews table. So you that is not removed, but it's still easier to, to have one method to create all the data. So the sign of a good factory, what is the sign of a good factory? Uh, it's when a dev or a QA engineer uses it to create data for manual testing. So we had um, a piece of development error view trackers where um, we were changing the uh, API that would be used under the hood only if your account had over a million reviews. And uh, in order to test this uh, in CI and on your local computer, what the developer did was they used the factory and just created a, a for loop uh, looping a million times using the factory to create a million reviews. And that took five minutes. So now they had the setup for those million reviews so that they can easily test their code. Uh, so that's when you know your factory is doing good work. Um, so to create some more of that testing culture, I would posit to be damp, not dry. What does that mean? Uh, the phrase damp means descriptive and meaningful phrases. Um, not dry, which is don't repeat yourself. And dry is kind of a tenant of developers um, to um, refactor your code. And you know, if you see the same code doing things over and over again, um, refactor that code to only be one method and have arguments. And 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 uh, I would say, since tests don't have tests, um, it's important to to uh, be more descriptive. And don't worry about dry. Um, don't refactor your code. So well, here's an example. So this is a dry test. And why is it dry? It's dry because um, that method register all users. Um, you can reuse that across tests because what it does is it just takes in the user's objects and it just registers them. Um, but when you do it this way, the method register all users, it's not clear which users it's registering, or I guess it's registering all of them, but like um, it's not as readable uh, because now if I want to know which users are being registered, I have to go into the setup block and read that users, uh, read the users up there. Um, so it's not as reasonable to, to make it dry. So I would suggest to make your test damp. And uh, this is what a damp version of that test would look like. Uh, I'm explicitly creating the users. I'm explicitly registering them. I'm not using uh, methods that do those actions. Um, but since it's important to the test case, we're, we're registering them right there. Um, and I would posit that this is the, the better way to write tests. Um, you don't have to go into another file and then understand what that helper method does. Um, I'm sure we've all heard of the phrase copy-paste programming, and I'll posit that that's okay to do in test repos. And uh, 
really what I like to do is copy paste tweak programming. And here's an example of me doing copy paste tweak programming. Like I took um, that case from before where we're, um, we're registering multiple users. And now the new test case is the test can't register multiple users with the same email. So it's a little tweak on the last test case. And um, I'm creating a, two users with the same email. Both of them have the email Alice. They're both being registered. And then the assertions are changed a little bit. Instead of asserting that it both are registered, I'm asserting that the du one of the duplicates isn't registered. So here I have copied and pasted and tweaked. Um, so creating culture testing. So I'll suggest create, it's really important to create documentation for contributing to the test repository. Um, why is it important to create documentation? Uh, Selenium can do a lot, but as an API, it has its quirks. We all know that it's a little bit quirky. Um, it's not the easiest to use if you don't have experience with it. Um, I'm sure you've all seen these kinds of Stack Overflow posts. There's hundreds of them. Uh, and just to show that Selenium is a little bit complicated under the hood, um, this is from the W3C specification for like how a, a Selenium click works, and there's a lot of steps in there. Uh, Selenium does a lot of stuff. So um, what I'm trying to say is Selenium can be a little bit uh, hard to use at times. So what I would suggest is you providing documentation that makes contributing to your tests easier. So here's some examples of documentation. We have a review trackers for, for making contributing to tests easier. Um, if developers see that documentation, they'll be able to speed through it and write those tests because uh, the docs will help them do it. Um, it's just kind of a good treasure trove of knowledge to have. Um, I would also posit to create test helpers that make Selenium less daunting. Uh, it wouldn't be ideal if each engineer wrote their own code to scroll to a specific place or fill in a field. So here are some examples of, of um, test uh, helpers that I've made for review trackers to, to do those kind of simple Selenium actions because Selenium can be a little challenging. Um, Here's another example of fill in input. This is a custom method we have here, view trackers. And then um, I'll also suggest that you all use common coding practices like doc strings and comments so engineers can understand your tests easily. I would say that the documentation doesn't need, only need to be in document form, it can also be in your code. So, yeah, use those doc strings, use the commenting functionality that your developers are familiar with uh, to, so they can use your utilities. Um, so in addition to how to contribute, I would suggest to have documents on the services the tests use and how to investigate their outages. Um, why should we have that kind of documentation? Isn't that kind of overkill? I would say no, because when a service is down, it's high pressure. Uh, we don't want that to be the time to learn about a service and a doc can really help a treasure feel less stressed when they're investigating things. So, um, and uh, the, doc, the status checks in your test service documentation for like what services that test use. So that's really great. So if you then have documentation for how to investigate each of those services, um, for example, like where to check the logs, where to see the uptime, how to connect to the database, uh, how is the service different in each environment, you know, whatever makes investigating easier, like put that in a document for each of those services and then um, have that documentation accessible so that if the service is down, if the service is having a test issue, people can investigate it. Um, at review trackers, we even have general steps uh, like this uh, for just triaging test failures in, in the first place. And I kind of got this idea from the book, The Checklist Manifesto. Uh, like even, so when you're, when you're doing stressful tasks, it's helpful to have checklists because it helps you stay on task. When, they, when there's a stressful situation, um, without a checklist, you, you have a tendency to get off track or um, not stay focused. But the, the checklists, in a, in a high pressure scenario, the checklists help you stay focused. Um, so yeah, I would suggest creating a checklist like this, this to, um, to help in those investigators. So, more about the culture, creating the culture testing, I would suggest that we have strong programming paradigms in our test code. Um, 
treat the formatting in your test code the same as production code. You know, run your linters, have good naming conventions, file structure, design patterns. Um, use all those things. Don't don't tell people, oh, it's just test code. We can do it however we want. Um, I would say have the exact same standards as you do your production code. Yeah. Um, okay, two more slides. Cool. I'm, I'm like nearing the end. Um, I would suggest you configure the test similar to the production code itself, if possible, um, so that there's less context switching for the developer who's contributing to the tests. Um, that's really helpful. Um, context switching reduces productivity. So if you've got JavaScript uh, code, JavaScript production code, make the tests written in JavaScript, et cetera, and use the same file structure, stuff like that. Um, other people should be able to read a test and know what's going on, test code is code, blah, blah, blah. Um, avoid conditional logic in your test cases. Um, I would posit that instead of doing a test case like this, where it handles city search and Google and Facebook and Yelp in one test, uh, do it like this, where um, the test knows that it's handling a Google review and it's only asserting about that Google review. Um, conditional logic in test cases makes them harder to interpret and harder to follow the flow. So yeah, make sure that you eliminate that kind of conditional logic. Um, I'll also say if there's a test that does a different thing in a different environment, um, separate it into two different tests and skip the irrelevant tests in the irrelevant environment. So here is an example of a test where in Docker and local, it skips an assertion. And um, I would suggest instead of doing it like that, do it like this, where now I have two versions of that test and um, it does different things based on the different environment that it's in. Cool. Um, I'll stop there. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of the content, but um, the other slides are really good. <laughs> so you'll be able to get through it. I hope this was good. So I got um, a comment from Samar who said, saving passwords in logs is not a good practice. And what I would say to Samar is you're 100% correct. Uh, it is not good practice. Uh, however, um, for these tests, these are only run in lower environments and each test is segmented to um, a single account. And that account only has certain kinds of permissions with our access control scheme. So um, there's no risk in us providing those uh, passwords. No attacker could do anything with those passwords because all that they do is they give access to the, that one account and that's only present in our lower environments and all the data for that account was also created by that test itself anyways. So like uh, thank you Zach for sharing your experience with us today.